Hey viewers, I figured I'd better hurry up and release my video on Starfield's world building before its first DLC comes out because I don't want to buy Shattered Space at full price and I don't want to have to analyze any new information about Starfield. Originally I wanted to make an hour long video and really tear its universe apart in depth, but that's simply too much effort and time that this game doesn't deserve. Instead I'm going to hammer home three key points. I started with four, but I had to cut one for time and I'll leave the detailed analysis to others who have more patience than I do. Point 1. Working within the limits of the creation engine as well as self-imposed design constraints crippled Starfield's story and world-building possibilities. Picture trying to run a race, but as soon as you get out of the starting gate someone shoots you in both legs. It would honestly be a miracle if you managed to crawl your way past the finish line. Well, for Starfield, one bullet was trying to make a game while ignoring technological realities, and the other bullet was leadership's stubborn adherence to antiquated design choices. Here's what I mean by the first bullet. Starfield is a game that doesn't fit the engine it was built in. It seems obvious to me that the original idea of Starfield was a massive open galaxy where you could freely travel between a thousand planets. There would be dozens of cities, dozens of factions, hundreds of quests. There'd be space combat, mech combat, ground combat, infinite procedural dungeons. I think they wanted to make something as boundary pushing and innovative as Daggerfall was 20 plus years ago, but with the expected modern Bethesda handcrafted content supplementing the procedural stuff. Basically they wanted to marry what they did in Arena and Daggerfall with what they did in their more modern games. In short, they bit off way more than they could chew, but arrogantly thought they had the experience and talent to pull off this pie in the sky idea. I suspect successes with early tech demos egged them on because yeah, with today's technology you can generate an infinite number of landscapes quite easily. And then the creation engine reared its ugly head. Now I wasn't there, obviously I don't know what actually happened during Starfield's development. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall over there in Rockville, but I wasn't. But here's roughly how I imagine things went down. Bethesda realized it wasn't possible to seamlessly transition between the space and ground sections of Starfield. They decided, oh, that's not a big deal, and kept soldiering on. Then they realized planet surfaces would need to be segmented into small world spaces separated by loading screens. Okay, no problem, keep going. Then I bet they spent an inordinate amount of time trying to get mechs working before realizing they had to be cut too. That's fine, uh, they can be used as uh, set dressing. Emil, right into the lore that mechs are banned now, okay? Everything's okay. Oh shit, we can't do procedural dungeons. Uh, quick, whip up some handcrafted ones, it'll be fine. Nobody will notice. Wait, we can't put Earth into the game? Uh, just turn it into a giant desert. We'll have Emil write an explanation for that. Oh fuck, the release date is coming and our game is a broken mess. Uh, we need more time, Microsoft, we need to delay this. Oh crap, House Varun's content is behind schedule. Ah, uh, fuck it, we'll just cut them from the game entirely. We can add them back in the DLC. Emil, come up with an excuse for why they went missing. Bit by bit, the original vision for Starfield was cut down by attrition, and the final game is a mere shadow of what was originally planned. At least, that's what I speculate happened. I freely admit this is an apocryphal narrative I'm crafting. However, there is a great deal of evidence to support it. Anyways, this is related to the writing because just like how a good movie script could be ruined by bad acting and cheap special effects, Starfield's writing can obviously be only as good as the other content in the game. If a game has mechs that can't be piloted but also can't be cut entirely because too much work was poured into them to not use them, you have to write around that fact, and that's not easy. If entire factions and cities are outright missing, that's going to disrupt some of your story ideas. It especially hurts if your ideas weren't very good in the first place. Of course, a lot of the decisions about what to cut likely came down to Emil Pagliarulo too because he is credited as both design director and writing director. He and Todd Howard are the most to blame for Starfield's flaws. Maybe they didn't come up with every bad idea, but they certainly gave the go-ahead to everything in Starfield. That brings me to those design constraints I mentioned at the start. Since Oblivion, Bethesda has followed a strange mandate that the player must never be allowed to fail unless they die, and can never be locked out of content. Of course, Starfield is no exception. The consequences of this absurd design decision are felt everywhere. Starfield seems to have more essential NPCs than any other Bethesda game. Even shopkeepers are essential now for whatever reason. Furthermore, Bethesda's gone and added what I'd call super essential NPCs. Bullets phase right through them like they're children. It's all to remove the possibility of failing any quests. 
Also, you can do every single quest with one character, no matter how ridiculous it is. You can become a Class 1 citizen of the United Colonies after siding with the Crimson Fleet and destroying UC Sysdef. That would be like winning the Medal of Honor after blowing up a US aircraft carrier. You can be a Freestar Ranger on the same character too, no conflict of interest there. Credit where it's due, there is at least some attempt to explain how you can do all these quests on one character, but it comes across like you're getting a free pass to do anything because you're the special video game protagonist. I don't understand what Bethesda has against making quest lines mutually exclusive. As far as I'm concerned, it adds massive replay value. Once you're done with one character, knowing there's quests you missed encourages you to start over with a completely different character and explore those alternate paths. Perhaps they're worried that locking off too much content would expose the fact that their latest games are not quite as large as the marketing made them out to be. Besides the main quest and four faction quest lines, most of Starfield's side quests are boring fetch quests or radiant garbage. And while I can't find an exact count, I suspect Starfield doesn't have that many more quests than Skyrim does. Anyways, if encouraging the player to start a new game is unconscionable for Bethesda, then why not use the Unity as a failsafe to give the player a way to undo their mistakes and make different choices? The Unity is the ultimate get out of jail free card. It removes all the consequences of the player's actions and resets the universe back to its original state. So why the hell do our actions still have no consequences? Nobody needed to be essential in Starfield, certainly not Constellation. Bethesda could have easily designed a backup main quest to go through Radiant Dungeons and grab all the artifacts alone. Shooting important NPCs in the face could have had serious consequences like branding you as a terrorist for life, doomed to be hunted by the faction you attacked, and unable to complete any quests for them until you reset the universe. That might sound too extreme for most players, but Fallout New Vegas did it. If you become vilified with a faction in FNV, you can never get back into their good graces. You get some leeway in the first act of the story, but that's it. And I've never heard anybody complain about this design choice. It wasn't polarizing by any means. In fact, people seem to like it better than Bethesda's essential NPC bullshit. As it is, I don't understand why the Unity exists if you can see basically all the content Starfield has to offer in your first universe. Is it only there for the sake of temple grinds and memes about Sarah Morgan being a potted plant? The only real benefit I've found to going through the Unity is it de-bloats your save game and fixes various bugs. What a joke. Moving on, point two, Starfield's lore is inconsistent and poorly thought out. It's a completely new IP which gave Bethesda the opportunity to develop a rich setting full of interesting and unique ideas without stepping on any pre-established lore. I can't believe this is what we got. Now, if Starfield was a five or six hour Call of Duty campaign, I could accept its shallow, style over substance nature, but this is a game we're supposed to be playing for the next decade. The lore should be deep and engaging. Unfortunately, it isn't. Right from the beginning of the game, the characters make statements totally at odds with the world they're part of. And this isn't a setting like Tamriel, where regular people might be in the dark about historical events because they're illiterate and ignorant. This is a technologically advanced universe. Heller talks about making unauthorized jumps into House Faroon space. Doesn't he know they got cut from the game? There is no House Faroon space. It's patently obvious House Faroon was originally meant to occupy the Serpentis system because it's named after a serpent. But there's nothing there now except Radiant Pig's Will. To prove she's somehow more stupid than Heller, Lynn then says something incredibly dumb. Half the crew doesn't believe Earth exists. Excuse me? How could anyone believe Earth isn't real when it's a figurative stone's throw away from the United Colony's second largest city, Cydonia, which is on Mars? It has the biggest mining industry in the settled system, so you'd think miners would know about it. By the way, why are so many people living on Mars instead of Earth? Earth sands its atmosphere still has more comfortable gravity and a hell of a lot more natural resources than Mars does. Yet Earth is one of the very few planets in Starfield with exactly zero human habitation. As you might expect, the game makes no attempt to explain this. It's a damn good thing though. If anybody else was interested in Earth, they would have discovered the secret behind grav drives and grabbed at the artifact at the NASA facility for themselves long before we had a chance to. Luckily, nobody cares despite old Earth artifacts being expensive collector's items. It's crazy to me that thanks to the Radiant POI system, there are more people living on Venus than on Earth. To take Starfield seriously, you basically have to treat its Radiant locations as non-canon. But then what you have left is a handful of tiny cities and infinite expanses of nothing. It makes it seem like humanity is nearly extinct because there can't be more than a few thousand people living in each of these cities. Where'd everyone go? 
Mankind has been living in space for nearly two centuries. Even if only a billion people survived that nasty business back on Earth, one would think there would be 10 billion or more humans by now, given a galaxy with dozens of Earth-like planets and near-infinite resources. Humans should be breeding like rats in a cheese factory, but for some unexplained reason, they aren't. Regardless of population size, why is anyone living in squalor in the well under New Atlantis when 99.9% .9 of Jemison is untouched, prime real estate, ripe for expansion? Obviously the real reason is because it's not possible to make a video game with realistically sized cities. But it is possible to make realistically sized planets, as long as they have nothing interesting on them. I've already explained in prior videos why this was a stupid idea, so I won't rehash that. Instead, let's return to the NASA launch facility, which is full of props still being used in buildings nearly 200 years after the facility was abandoned. Other locations separated from human civilization for centuries look basically the same as anywhere else too. The generation ship ECS Constant could easily pass for a more modern ship design. Would it have killed Bethesda to make some unique art assets for these pre-Exodus locations? They did it for weapons, but basically nothing else. All working computers, regardless of their age, have the exact same starware, hardware, and operating system. Apparently there's been no progress in personal computing for two centuries. There's also been no progress in ship design. Nova Galactic went out of business a hundred years before Starfield starts, but their ship parts are still comparable to what's available from extant manufacturers like Stroud Eklund or Hope Tech. These details make Starfield a very technologically stagnant universe, far more so than Fallout is. And Fallout has the obvious excuse of most of the planet being nuked to hell, and humanity understandably being more concerned with survival than making new discoveries. There is no such justification for the lack of technological progress in the Starfield universe. When developing their timeline, I assume Bethesda was only concerned with major events, and didn't consider exactly when and how future technology would develop, which is a real world-building screw-up. You know, they could have at least tried to justify the stagnation by saying that most of humanity's collective knowledge was destroyed along with Earth. Or maybe people who survived the Exodus were not necessarily the best and brightest minds, but rather those who had money or just got lucky. Thus, many technologies were lost or remain only barely maintained. Perhaps the lack of instant communication between planets makes it difficult for scientists to coordinate. Maybe human innovation reached the point of diminishing returns. I don't know. I would accept almost any explanation, but none is forthcoming from Starfield because Bethesda didn't think about basic facts of their new setting. I guess they were too busy copying Rockstar Games. It's pretty obvious why they turned Aquila City into Cowboy Town. It's such a shame, too. The city morphed from the unique Himalayan-esque setting of the concept art, and except for Far Cry 4, I haven't heard of any game set in the Himalayas, into this shitty Red Dead ripoff. A city situated high in the mountains with thin air and high gravity would fit perfectly with the rugged individualist, survive by the sweat of your brow ideology of the Freestar Collective. You would understand how the people of Aquila could win a war despite being outnumbered and outgunned. As it is now, it feels like Neon should have been the capital of the FSC, and Aquila City should be a neglected backwater, only notable due to its historical significance. If only there were more than two cities in the Freestar Collective, I would have actually been okay with Aquila. Of course, with modern graphics and full voice acting, that was never going to be possible. Starfield is not, and could not be, much bigger than Skyrim. Speaking of Skyrim, its central conceit is that you are a dragonborn, blessed by Akatosh, but in Starfield there's no reason why you're treated like a god and everyone looks to you to solve their problems. Many quests begin unnaturally with you barging into somebody's office and instead of throwing you out, the person sitting there tells you their whole life story and tasks you with something they should have had their employees deal with instead. That's why I kind of like the start of the Ryujin Industries quest because it starts naturally with you filling out a job application and fetching coffee. Of course, it loses points for me because it's literally impossible to fail the interview process even if you take your clothes off and answer every question like an idiot. And the main story is a total mess that fails to answer any of the questions it brings up. Who created the artifacts? Who built the temples? Oh, the creators, of course. Where does this free ship and set of armor come from when I go through the Unity? Why am I sent back to Vectera and not some other point in space? Why is the Lodge the only place that's different in other universes? No answers, just do the whole game over again, this time with Starborn checks to skip a few things. Sorry Bethesda, but your game is barely tolerable enough for a single playthrough, let alone multiple. It would have been cool if the hunt for the artifacts and temples turned out to be a game designed by some cosmic beings that want to see humans fight and kill each other for their own amusement. Or maybe the unity is a way to distract and cull humanity so we don't get too powerful. 
That would be interesting, but like any good idea, it's nowhere to be found in Starfield. There's no way to call out the loop after going through it a few times. So much missed potential everywhere you look. Alright, point number three. Starfield is a sterile, bland game that says nothing, lest it offend somebody. This is definitely the most subjective point of all, but in my view, Starfield presents us with a very dystopian look at the future, featuring two barely distinguishable factions controlled by corrupt oligarchies ruling over largely complacent populations. Despite being a multiverse-hopping demigod with magic rock powers, there's nothing the player can do to alter this situation. All the people in power are shielded by Bethesda's essential flag, and every questline ends with the status quo continuing indefinitely. You can swap out the leader of Ryujin, but both options are terrible for the people working there. You can have the UC execute Ve Victus, but they'll never do anything to reform their tiered citizenship system or tackle the shitty living situation of the people in the well. There's no way to change the Freestar Collective either. You can't kill Benjamin Bayou or remove him from power because the game artificially disallows it. If Starfield is supposed to be a story about finding hope, I sure as hell don't see it. Science fiction has always tried to analogize issues in the real world to make people reconsider their own ideas and preconceptions. Starfield doesn't do this. Ideally, it would have presented us with multiple societies, many possible visions of the future, and given us a chance to side with one to help bring it to fruition. Oddly enough, Skyrim does a much better job here, with a strong B-plot about a struggle between nationalism and imperialism. There's religious persecution, racism, political intrigue. Starfield doesn't even come close. It's got no racism because there's no alien species, and the population of every faction is the same multi-ethnic mix, so there'd be no impetus for conflict even if Bethesda wasn't too afraid to add any. Maybe there could have been some Cold War-style espionage between the UC and Freestar Collective, that could make for an awesome questline, but nope. Both factions cooperate with each other, and any conflict between them ended years before the game started. Quite the boring setup. At least nobody's going to be arguing about United Colonies vs. Freestar Collective for the next decade like they have been over Stormcloaks vs. Imperials. As for religion, I can understand not wanting to offend people's actual beliefs by presenting them in a video game, but why are the three new religions Bethesda designed just for Starfield's complete non-entities too? I'm surprised there's no option to join any of these religions and do quests for them. I guess all that ended up on the cutting room floor like so much else. Bethesda could have at least tackled some relatively less controversial topics like cybernetics or genetic modification, but didn't, aside from when use of such technology happened to be convenient. For example, many cities have a genetics facility called Enhance that can completely change someone's appearance but its sole use is recreating the player's face and body. Any other implications of this tech are never explored. It only costs 500 credits to use, which is the price of a few snacks at a vending machine. At such a low cost, how come nobody else is using this technology? Why does everybody have wrinkles and liver spots all over their face if it can be fixed by skipping a meal or two? Well, if you listen in on NPC conversations, you'll find them acting as if Enhance costs a small fortune. I assume the price must have changed at some point in development because if it cost 50,000 or 500,000 credits, then it would make sense only a few rich people have the ability to completely alter their appearance on a whim. There's an incalculable number of quest ideas that could explore the consequences of this technology. Perhaps a wealthy serial killer is using Enhance to change his DNA to evade law enforcement. Maybe someone causes a diplomatic incident by stealing the appearance of a foreign politician. Or there could be a side quest to help a poor person save up for a round of enhanced treatment to cure their cancer. But Bethesda was totally uninterested in telling these kinds of stories. Seems like Starfield is hard sci-fi in its art style only. Another example, there's a cloning facility on one planet maintained by robots that makes copies of important historical figures, seemingly only so there can be a wacky Fallout style quest. Why human cloning isn't more widespread is left unexplained, as far as I can tell. I'll admit I didn't get to finish the quest because every NPC in the facility started shooting me for no reason while I was simply talking to one of them because this is a Bethesda game. Of course the quest scripting is broken. At that point, I was just done. Multiply these missed opportunities by a hundred times and that is Starfield to me, a galaxy's worth of wasted potential. I searched this game far and wide for something, anything that could pique my interest, introduce me to new ideas, or challenge the ones I already have, but came up with nothing. According to Emil, Starfield is supposed to make you ask the big questions, find God, or lose him if you already had him. 
The only faith I lost, though, is faith in Bethesda ever making a decent game again. My plan was to cap off this video by noting some positives about Starfield at least being less buggy and more stable than Fallout 4, but after playing for 150 hours, well, I had an inclement weather effect stuck on my HUD. I had to enter console commands to delete image space modifiers because they were making it take 5 seconds to save the game. I had that same bug from Fallout 4 where you can't change perspectives until entering a different console command. Massive physics objects started bugging out during the Terror Morph attack on New Atlantis. One time the game started using twice as much VRAM as normal for no reason, making it run at 2 FPS until I restarted. After 6 months, Bethesda still haven't fixed equipped throwables making you reload slower when you have the rapid reloading skill. I found a rapid melee weapon and discovered that legendary effect doesn't work on melee weapons because no one ever tested melee during development. I've had infinite loading screens, I had a dozen CTDs in as many hours while trying to record b-roll for this shitty video, and after all that, no, I can't say Starfield has any more stability than Fallout 4. They're both technical disasters. When you add these technical problems, many of which return from Fallout 4 or from Bethesda's even earlier games, on top of the generally mediocre experience, you get a game I have no interest in touching again. The next time I'll double-click its executable will be in two years, when all the DLCs are out and the first total conversions start rolling in to entirely replace its boring universe and bland gameplay. But frankly, I wouldn't blame modders for not wanting to go through the effort of putting lipstick on this gross pig. I'm done with Starfield, I'm not making any more videos about it, and I won't cover any mods for it either. Not for a long while. I'll stick with Fallout 4, occasionally review some New Vegas mods, and perhaps finally start covering Skyrim mods like I promised. That's my plan for the near future. Hope you enjoyed this video, and uh, yeah, toodles everybody.